Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to talk about a bony feature on some long bones called an apophysis or plural apophyses. And then we'll actually look at a couple of conditions that result from overuse and pulling on those apophyses, and those are each called an apophysitis. Now to start off, I have this figure right here, and by no means are we going to go through all of it, but I just want to mention a few things. So this figure depicts the development over time of long bones, uh, starting with this hyaline cartilage matrix. So remember that long bones develop from this in utero. So they start off as hyaline cartilage, very spongy like this, and over time they get more and more ossification until they resemble something that we might have in a pediatric patient right here. The second thing might seem a little bit obvious, but just to know what the long bones are, right? In the upper extremity, we have the clavicle, we have the humerus, the radius, the ulna. In the lower extremity, we would have the femur, the tibia, the fibula, right? Those are our long bones that we're talking about. And the other really important thing to understand here is that in the development, we initially start off here with a primary ossification center. That's in the center of what will become the long bone here in the shaft. And then later on, we end up with secondary ossification centers. So here's one secondary ossification center that's on one end of the long bone. And on the other end, which isn't shown but would be way down here, we'd have another secondary ossification center. Okay? So the way that bone development is typically taught, and really most anatomy, is that you have two secondary ossification centers in long bones. You have one on the proximal end of the long bone, and you have one on the distal end of the long bone. Bone. So if we think about a few bones, right, in the humerus, the proximal secondary ossification center would become the humeral head, right? The distal secondary ossification center would become basically down at the end by the elbow where you've got the trochlea, the capitulum, and the olecranon fossa, right? If we were to consider the femur, then the proximal secondary ossification center would become the femoral head, and the distal secondary ossification center would be down here where it articulates with the knee, and we've got the medial and lateral femoral condyles, right? And that's the way that this is typically taught with long bones. You have two secondary ossification centers, one on the proximal end and one on the distal end. Now hold that in mind. We're gonna come back to that in just a minute, but first, let's actually go over some relevant anatomy here. The first thing we have here are the epiphyses, or singular epiphysis. So the epiphyses are really just the proximal and distal terminal ends of the long bone. So up here, in dark blue, this is the proximal epiphysis. For the femur, it would be the femoral head, right? That's the proximal epiphysis. And down here would be the distal epiphysis. This is the part of the femur that articulates at the knee joint with the tibia, right? That's the distal epiphysis. Then we have the physis, or the physis singular. These are directly internal to the epiphyses. Okay, so the physis is really just a fancy term for a cartilage growth plate that allows the bone to grow in length. Remember that pediatric patients have growth plates. That's what kids have. And eventually they ossify, and then the person no longer grows in length. But this would be the proximal physis right here, directly internal to the proximal epiphysis. And then this would be the distal physis, or the distal growth plate, that is directly internal to the distal epiphysis. So the physis is just a cartilage growth plate. Then we have the metaphyses, which are directly internal to the physis. Okay? So right here, this would be the distal metaphysis, directly internal to the distal physis. And then over here is the proximal metaphysis, directly internal to the proximal physis. And then internal to the metaphyses would be the diaphysis, which is really just the shaft of the long bone. Okay? So backtracking, remember we have those two secondary ossification centers normally in the ends of long bones. One's found in the proximal epiphysis, one's found in the distal epiphysis. So two per bone, right? Not necessarily. Some long bones actually have additional secondary ossification centers, and they're contained in regions of the bone called apophyses, and an individual one is called an apophysis. So take a look up here. So we've got two that are pointed out here on the femur. This is one apophysis, and then this is another apophysis. And you'll notice that they also have individual growth plates, right? 
And each one of these apotheses has its own separate secondary ossification center. Okay? This secondary ossification center is distinct and separate from the two that are in the epiphyses at the ends of the long bones. So right here, we can say the femur actually has four secondary ossification centers. Two are in the ends, proximal and distal epiphyses, and one is in this apophysis right here, and the other is in this second apophysis right there, and then they each have their own individual growth plates. And so you could think of these apophyses as not only developing separately, but they also grow separately due to their distinct and separate ossification centers, and then once the growth plates fuse and ossify uh, near or after adolescence, then these bones have effectively fused with the rest of the femur. Now these apophyses are important structures because they actually are important bony landmarks on the femur. What is this apophysis up here that's a little bit larger than the other? This is the greater trochanter. And we know that the greater trochanter provides many insertions for a lot of different muscles, including the gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and several of the external rotators of the hip. This one down here, this apophysis that's a little bit smaller, or lesser we might say, is the lesser trochanter, which is the insertion of the iliopsoas muscle, both psoas major and iliacus, right? So these are attachment sites of muscles. It's also worth noting that the tibia has one, that's the tibial tuberosity, and the foot also has one on the calcaneus specifically called the calcaneal tuberosity. These structures all develop as apophyses, and so in pediatric patients, they may not be fully fused to the rest of the bone, once adolescence occurs and the growth plates fuse, they do become fused to the rest of the bone. So they grow separately, and then they have to fuse later on. So what might happen if you have a muscle that attaches on one of these, and you're overusing that muscle, and you're pulling, and you're pulling lots and lots of force over time chronically, what do you think might happen to this bone? Well, you'll create a tension overuse injury. The first one we're going to look at is not on the femur. It's actually on the tibia. And this is what's called tibial apophysitis. It has a fancy name, which is osgood schlatter syndrome. So here's basically your setup of the knee joint, right? Here is your femur, right? And then this muscle right here is the quadriceps. Down here is the tibia. And then this little dot right there, that's meant to be the tibial tuberosity. And I'm meaning to show that it is attached to the tibia, but it's not completely fused yet in a pediatric patient. And then this bone right here, this is the patella. So this would be the quadriceps tendon or the patellar tendon. Down here would be the patellar ligament. And so what we know is that when the quadriceps contract, it puts tension on that quadriceps tendon or patellar tendon, which pulls the patella, which then pulls on the patellar ligament, which then pulls on the tibial tuberosity. Now for adults, we use this extensor mechanism all the time. And sure, we might have some tendinous injuries or ligamentous injuries, but the tibial tuberosity in us is already fused with the rest of the tibia. But in a pediatric patient who might be chronically overusing their quadriceps or any activity that involves knee extension, this extensor mechanism is chronically pulling and pulling and pulling on the tibial tuberosity with lots of force, um, and it basically creates an overuse injury where we get inflammation there between the tibial tuberosity and the rest of the tibia. And it's a painful inflammation. Now in the vast majority of cases, it's just that, it's inflammation. And you can see that over here. So here's the tibia, here's the femur up here. You can even see the growth plate of the distal femur right there. Here's the patella. Here's the growth plate of the proximal tibia right there. And then right here is that tibial apophysis. This is the tibial tuberosity. You can see this black space right here, or darker space, which is really just that growth plate, signifying that the tibial tuberosity has not yet fused to the rest of the tibia. And normally, it's just going to be inflammation there, and it can be resolved with conservative care. In rare cases, if there's enough pull on this, the patellar ligament, which you can actually kind of see right here, may actually evolve the tibial tuberosity off, but that's extremely rare. Generally, it's just inflammation um, kind of in that growth plate area because you're chronically pulling on that tibial tuberosity and it's not yet fused to the rest of the tibia. How does this present? Well, tibial apophysitis or osgood schlatter syndrome is going to present with tenderness and local swelling in that area of the tibial tuberosity. Again, there's going to be swelling there because there's inflammation. You are chronically pulling on that tibial tuberosity and it's not yet fused.
Another thing that might also happen is the tibial tuberosity may be more prominent to palpation because it'll actually be a little bit larger and thicker. And the reason for that is you're chronically pulling on the tibial tuberosity with this knee extensor mechanism. And so in an attempt to uh, heal the tissue and keep that tuberosity in contact with the rest of the tibia before it fuses, it's laying down more bone. And so it may actually be a little bit thicker and larger and more prominent to palpation. What's going to reproduce the pain? Really anything that utilizes that extensor mechanism, uh, in particular with a lot of force. So things like jumping, squatting may actually do it as well. And then kneeling. So kneeling on shins will actually put the tibial tuberosity in contact with the ground and then the person's weight will be on it. That will also reproduce the pain. So how is this managed? Well, unless it's an avulsion and completely removes this right off of the tibia, it's going to be non-operative conservative care. So it's an apophysitis. There's inflammation. So ice will be used to cool down that inflammation. And then there's a lot of activity modifications. Um, we may want to strengthen the quadriceps, hamstrings, hip abductors and external rotators, but we want to strengthen it without aggravating this tibial tuberosity. So it's going to be lighter strengthening exercises, not jumping or things like that. And also improving the flexibility of the hamstrings, uh, the tensor fascia lata, uh, not really the IT band flexibility specifically, but the TFL, and then the triceps surrey like the gastroc and the soleus. There's another type of apophysitis called calcaneal apophysitis, also called Severs disease. So here's the foot, obviously, and then this bone right here is the calcaneus. And the most posterior part of this actually develops as an apophysis. Okay, this is called the calcaneal apophysis. And you can see here, here's the plantar flexors. This would be the gastrocnemius. And you can see that Achilles tendon also. And you'll notice that the gastroc and really any of those muscles, including the soleus, through the Achilles tendon actually insert not only on the calcaneus, but they do it on the calcaneal apophysis. Okay, And we're going to make a similar argument to what we did here for the tibial apophysitis. It's an overuse injury. Now, is it going to be knee extension that does this? No, it's going to be something that pulls up on the calcaneal apophysis. What would do that? Plantar flexion. So if somebody has calcaneal apophysitis, it's going to be plantar flexion that aggravates this. Because if you do plantar flexion and go up on your on the balls of your feet and on your tippy toes, right? You know, then the gastroc and soleus are contracting and pulling up and putting tension on that calcaneal apophysis. And so if somebody was chronically using their plantar flexors and pulling, pulling, pulling with a lot of tension over time it's going to tend to cause that apophysis to want to pull away from the rest of the calcaneus because you've got the still developing growth plate. The bones have not fused yet. And so there's going to be inflammation in that growth plate area or even at the insertion of the Achilles tendon on the calcaneus. Okay? The presentation, in addition to being reproduced by plantar flexion, is really just going to be local tenderness in the area of that calcaneus. Now here's an x-ray of Severs disease. So right here you see the majority of the calcaneus, right? And it's got a certain level of whiteness, radiopaque, right? And then over here's the calcaneal apophysis with the growth plate in between it and the rest of the calcaneus. You'll notice the calcaneal apophysis is more white. It's more radioopaque. This is a sign that you've got an issue with that bone where there's increased ossification. So remember we talked about with the tibial apophysitis that when you get this chronic pulling on it uh, by the quadriceps tendon and the patellar ligament, the bone actually gets increased ossification because it's trying to heal and maintain contact with the rest of the developing bone. Right? So if you've got excessive plantar flexion, a chronic overuse injury, the calcaneal apophysis is going to respond through increased ossification uh, to attempt to maintain contact with the rest of the calcaneus. And so this is an indication that this is not a normal calcaneal apophysis, that it may actually be Severs disease in conjunction with reproduction of uh, the pain with plantar flexion, okay? especially since we still have this developing growth plate and it's in a pediatric patient. How is this treated? In a very similar way to osgood schlatter syndrome. So it's going to be non-operative unless there happens to be a complete avulsion, which is very rare. So we're still going to use ice, may also use some anti-inflammatory medication. Um, again, the ice is to help cool down that inflammation, and the medication should also be used to target that inflammation. So NSAIDs might actually be appropriate in that case because they're anti-inflammatory. Uh, there may actually be the use of an orthosis or a heel cup or a heel lift, basically to get that heel off the ground.
There's also going to be activity modifications, just like we saw with uh, osgood schlatter syndrome, and then also stretching the Achilles tendon and with manual mobilization. So why would you want to stretch the Achilles tendon? Well, if you stretch it, it's going to get longer, theoretically, right? And if you lengthen the Achilles tendon, then even at rest, there's not going to be as much tension on that calcaneal apophysis, and that's going to allow it to heal, okay? So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of what an apophysis is and also two of the major apophysitis that uh, present in the pediatric population. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.